So I should go ahead and introduce yeah. myself to the camera, sure. to the, the audience out on YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And here. Um, well, my name is Julie Carini, as I imagine some of you guys checked out links and questions I sent to think about. Um, you might know that I teach here in the School of Art and Design. This is my third year teaching at PSU. I've been making films and videos almost my whole life. Hi. Um, or ever since I was able, <laughs> since I was like 15. Um, and I didn't really bring any formal presentation. I was kind of taking the conversation thing seriously. I was yeah. like, I know some of you guys already. This sounds like a great opportunity to like dig into some questions maybe we've all been wanting to dig into already for a while. And then some of you guys are new to me. I'm excited to talk to you too. Um, so I don't know where to begin with it. Um, okay. And just as a quick note, there's a few um, comments. Apparently, the mic dragging is not good. Oh. So let's not let's do not that. that. Let's, like lift it up and move it, I guess. Yeah. And also, uh, Jim is saying that she thinks the sound is worse. Oh. So. Do you want me to? I can hook uh, up the other. Mm -hmm. should, yeah, should we really go through the switch, or should we just? No, we'll just hook up the mic. Yeah, we'll just, just, just oh, you can just talk in my. Okay. All right. So, um, yeah, I mean, if folks wanted to start off with with uh, questions, comments related to what you've seen. Or, or do you want to start with some of the questions you sent? Yeah, we could. Um, I'd have to look and see what those were. I don't remember. Um, and I know, I mean, I sent you hours and hours of videos to watch. Of course, you're never really going to watch all of that, most likely. Um, yeah, but if you got a sense of some of the stuff I'm working <coughs> on, is the main thing. I yeah. think, yeah, I did tailor the questions knowing you guys and what you're thinking about a little right. bit. There we go. What uh, does it yeah. mean to use one's own life as a source of material for our works? That's Should one. we start with that one? The first one? Do you, uh, sure. Or do you yeah. Yeah. want to have another one? And that's a nice one. Okay. That's personal. A lot of us are doing that whether we're uh, sort of conscious of that or not. Mm -hmm. Anybody have a comment? And feel free to turn it to me, even though you didn't get to see the videos, but you can respond to the questions. Do you want to start us off? What it means? <laughs> I think I wrestled with that. Like, why did I say what it means? You know, um, but uh, or what? It's, what's that experience do? Maybe it's right. another way to think about it. Or just a sub question of yeah. that. Like, what does it mean to use your life? Like, who's Julie Perini, and what does it mean for Julie Perini and yeah. Julie Perini's life? It's mm -hmm. the source wherever, because it's different for everybody. You know, yeah. People that may be using their life, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think I was trying to think of ones that would be not just about me. Right. But, yeah. Okay. You want to know? You want to? Well, no. Yeah. Perini. We don't have to. Yeah. No, no, we can start there. Um, I mean, I've been thinking about it for a long time. Um, I mean, I'm definitely interested in how, how can I say this? I think that's something a lot of you guys might be thinking about, like, you know, the line between where like art making is and like life is in my life is very indistinct. You know, um, it's there's it's not like now there's a special moment when I'm off doing the art thing. Although that's sort of true in some ways. You know, I do sort of make hours in my life where I'm like I'm gonna try to get into the headspace I want to get into. You know, but I mean at my, but really though, I'm kind of you thinking about making mostly videos or films or, you know, events and things just all the time. Like one example is making a daily video. Like I make this like 60 second single take video every single day and if I can I make more, you know, and there's this way that that's not a special time I set off to go work in my studio and make that. That's kind of just at some point during the day I have this moment of like pausing and thinking about where I actually am and what's actually happening and trying to get as fully present as possible. You know, and so, so for me, it's like that's, and then that gets kind of contextualized later as like art, you know, because it's shown in art circuits and stuff. But in the moment of making it, it was about this other thing, which was about sort of being as fully present as possible. I mean, so much of what I'm doing is really about that. So many kind of situations I'm instigating through movie making are a lot about trying to become as sort of in the moment as I can, you know. And 
So, so that's one way to approach the question, I guess. Um, but then there's also questions about like my own history or autobiography that is another like way of thinking about this question. Like, what does it mean to use that source material to make new things? You know, um, which is something I've been addressing more and more lately. Uh, not really in the past as much. You know, so and that has been a rich source of ideas, you know, just looking more and more at my own identity and history and social location, you know, kind of macro and micro things, you know, like my own personal narrative, but also how mine is really just representative of just larger social stories, you know, that are happening that I'm part of, but also sort of moved along by. Those are some ways to think about it. What do you guys think about making art about your own life? Yeah. Can I ask you a follow-up question? Uh huh. Um, so you said like so, so like the one-minute video is is like you're pausing and like creating a space to feel more present, and then some of those one-minute videos are like you brushing your teeth, and some of them are like you at a protest or like and a bunch of other different mm -hmm. things. Um, So I, I guess I'm wondering how like putting a camera either towards yourself or towards the world is making you more present versus uh -huh. like right. creating a barrier between true, or yeah. or even creating like a space where you're performing something. Right. Yeah. And, and yeah, then. that's the huge irony going through all of it, right? It's like how do you my graduate school, when I was in graduate school, my thesis was called Experiments in Immediacy. I was making videos about how to be without mediation, you know, it was this impossible thing, you know, there's always some frame or something, but I was still like, well, maybe we can push at the limits of it anyway, you know, but it was, so you're totally right, like, why don't I just drop the camera and stop, like, trying to make media about it, you know, um, and instead just do it, um, but, uh, and I'm still kind of working on that question, you know, I mean, I guess I think that there's ways that, yeah, that's, I mean, it's for me like having the ability to have a document that I can then like process more, you know, like use and reflect on and change and think about is is a big part of it. It's not just the present moment. Like being able to then think about what happened is uh, and understand it and change it and then communicate with other people about it, you know, having like something I can do that with is is something I just got, I'm really invested in, I guess, you know. Like I, I was, I, and I don't know how much like, you know, when you're a kid, just like, like I started out be thinking of myself as like a filmmaker. I loved like, well, I started out making writing actually as like a high school student. I was like a high school poet and stuff. But then I moved in, got really into like experimental filmmaking, thought it was the wackiest, greatest stuff. And I started making films and videos. And then at some point in grad school, I was like, yeah, let's drop the camera. I don't need it anymore. I'm just going to do performances. And I did like lots of like social projects that were events and stuff like that. No more camera for years. And I thought that's what I was going to do forever. But then I got to a point where I just like really missed that part where I get to craft something in, into you know another thing for someone else that can exist outside of me without me there, and kind of tried to take all those tools I've been learning in performance and brought them back to like video practices. And so, so I think a lot of stuff I got really more into like improv in video, like what does that look like? What's a, like kind of improvised camera, unplanned shooting, like all that kind of stuff. So, does that kind of get at what you're talking about? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The camera as like this feedback device from that one Alan Capro reading you showed me, where the camera it's not like it's interrupting the thing of being a pre of being present, but it's just this device to help you then create this feedback loop of your own experience mm -hmm. to look back on it and then I don't know not just remember it but then act on the actual thing that you crafted. That device helps you keep reflecting on your experience. So. Mm -hmm. But then again, I'm also interested I'm in the way a camera can provoke a situation too, you know? Like this is where I've been going lately with more like documentary type stuff where I'm actually interviewing subjects and stuff. I've kind of in the past few years been doing stuff I used to think I would never do, you know? Like like actually interview a subject. Like I was all about like never, never setting something up that contrived, you know? But I've since kind of 
gotten more interested in some of the ways those conventions help us, you know, or um, or those structures, right? Like the kind of comfort you can sit in because you know you're each in a role of subject and interviewer and stuff. Like, there's more to say about that, but but those are kind of a different camera that where the camera, the presence of it is kind of um, like provoking or um, just making new stuff come up that might not have come up for like let's say an interview subject who hasn't been asked those questions before or hasn't been asked them on camera like with a time machine. It does make a difference that you've got this thing on them and you're even acting out this very familiar kind of um, at this point in history like kind of thing of we're making a movie together, you know? Like people just un have some media literacy where they understand at least that this is going to go somewhere and be something. And that can clam some people up, but actually I've found it does the opposite most of the time. Like most, like you just don't, you don't know what someone's going to become. They may become who they've been wanting to become suddenly, you know? It's kind of a magical thing. And so, although it can also make some people not want to talk to them. Um, but yeah, so so that's a very different active camera, activating camera that I'm curious about lately too. The observational one that right is like the capra or feedback thing, but then there's also these ones that yeah do other things. Yeah, thanks yeah. for bringing that up. So. Yeah, and and I think back to your like about being present. It's interesting because I notice sometimes. When I have a camera, it makes me helps me see in a different way, and I don't know if it's like the intention of it or just um, like slow down and observe in a different way, or and then sometimes it does it acts as a barrier, and I'm not sure what makes that change happen, um, but yeah, the presence thing is kind of interesting, and I don't know if it's the intention of like this is what I'm doing, and so it's really clear and it's set out and then I don't have to, like, I know I'm not really deviating from that. Mm -hmm. Or, um, but it's something I've been thinking about a lot, too. And then, like, when it does act as a barrier, and then I just, like, want to be in the experience. Mm -hmm. So okay, I think that's an interesting mm -hmm. question. Mm -hmm. Julie was asking, like, what, like, how other, how we're also thinking about using ourselves and our, our ourselves as material in our work. And ourselves? Yeah. Like, what does it mean to do that? I think with my my sub question about for Julie Perini, I think one of the things that struck me most when I like became a, acquainted with your work was right when I moved to Portland and you first started doing the White Lady Diaries, and then you gave that talk like. Um, how many years was it? Twenty years or 30? I don't know how many years. Twenty years of race in the right. work of Julie Perini. Yeah. Because it, there's this kind of trope that happens when, like, an African American or a Mexican American does work. It's always like people look at their work through the lens of race, but rarely do people look at the work of a white person through the lens of race. Uh -huh. And so I found found that really compelling um, to like look at your work in that way, or that you were actually doing the work of looking at your work that way. Uh -huh. um, and so I think in that way, I think it's interesting to use your life as this material to kind of instigate a conversation that's not often happening, I think it's interesting. Mm -hmm. Not just as a matter of documenting or having this feedback loop in your own experience or interviewing the camera or something to intervene mm -hmm. in other people's lives, but like, what can we say about my life that isn't nothing usually said or something like that. Yeah. And so yeah, I also am kind of interested in the kind of an update on where you're at with that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. Um, I guess, I mean, the like daily video thing is what I've been doing for a while, but I've always had some sort of process in place of like shooting a lot of material in an unplanned way and then reviewing it later. I used to, before I started working on more community issues like police violence, I used to call this overall process shoot first and ask questions later, which does make sense, but I started to have a little sensitivity around that after working on police brutality issues. And so um, so I don't say that, but it's still kind of accurate, you know. Um, and there was just, yeah, I mean, I've probably talked with you personally about this, but there was just, for everybody, there was some snap one day where I kind of 
I can just tell you the story. I was at a lecture series event. What was it? It was at PSU a couple of years ago. There used to be a diversity artist lecture series or something like that. Um, yeah. Or, uh, yeah. The art department. Yeah. yeah. It isn't exa- you used to work on it. That's right. Mm-hmm. And I was at one of those lectures, and this artist was giving a talk, this Native American woman, talking all about you know, her language and family history and all the stuff she sees in her artwork and is telling me so I understand. She's kind of show, unpacking all these symbols. I had this like aha moment where I sat there thinking, wow, I never talk about my family and my artwork. I guess that's because it's not about my family or it's not about my culture or it's not about or something like that, you know, and then or my language or something. And then I was like, wait a second, I don't have to because I'm part of the like dominant group. I'm normal, I'm ideal, I'm all like I don't have to sit there and unpack all of these meanings. Like the idea is that everybody knows, you know? And so I was like, well wait a second, what would it look like if I did unpack it? Just like she did, you know, if I really just said like all you know, every location I'm in, every you know, all the things you're seeing in my videos, whatever, you know. Um what if I did say, you know, here's what it says about white American culture over and over and over. And it was so much easier than I realized it would ever be, you know. Um, like it just, it's, it's, it's everywhere. If you start, once, once you start to put that lens on, you know, you can't take it off. If you start to say like, well, what's like this, what is this artwork or anything, building, you know, like anything telling us about the culture it comes from, then you can, start to understand it better. So I just hadn't flipped that switch before. I'd just been making art, you know, which is just about life. But it's totally doing that. <laughs> and so, you know, and and so at that moment, right, my big task was just to try to understand what I'd done up to that point. Like what is it I could learn about race or my race or my country, culture, that kind of thing from it. But I wasn't yet like making new artworks, you know, that were like now gonna explore that for race day, you know, like the White Lady Diaries. I'd only done that talk that was a way to, like, review, you know, it was called 30, at that time I was 34 years old, it was called 34 Years of Whiteness. And then I did it, then I changed it to just, I don't know, White Lady Art Talk or something, because I stopped, it was annoying to update every year, and like 35 Years of Whiteness. (laughs) I I keep doing these art projects, so that's just something about time. I'm really interested in these serial things that like go on forever, daily videos, and you know, things like that. Um, But uh, yeah, so then I made that one piece like a year or more ago, because I realized um, like, wow, I've been collecting all of these little videos about my everyday life. This is like, an archive of whiteness, you know, like, I, it's like what a white person does every day, it's all there, like, let's look at it. And so I made this one short video called White Lady Diaries that kind of just uses... Did everyone get a chance to look at that? Yeah. Do we, do we want to maybe just show that one oh, or something here. so that everyone's on the same page? Sure. Oh my goodness. What were you saying? No, I mean, you don't want to. No, no, you can do it. I'm oh. just feigning, just that way feigning shyness. Everyone would know what yeah. we're talking about. <laughs> okay. And if yeah. folks at a distance oh, can, yeah. it's in it's in the links. Oh well, yeah. That was sent out, so it's the and it's on Julie's website. So if you just go to his website and the white lady there diaries. You go. And do we need to shut ourselves off so they can hear it there or something? Yeah, they can or they can hear it. I'm going away. I went away. Thank <laughs> you. 
Thanks for watching. This is not a way to say what it was saying for and we're not considering you have to like saying ourselves and so we can wait for I think like if in very general terms we're always or with all of us with ourselves because what we decide to pay attention to what we're interested in goes through, you know, who we are, our bodies and our way of seeing the world. And and the issue is that, you know, some have the privilege of not having to think about that. You know, what does it mean to be yourself when you're doing this? Mm -hmm. And some people kind of have to think about mm -hmm. it, you know, because there's way more at stake mm -hmm. in, in terms of, like, the things you're saying and how you're saying them and what you're communicating with your work. Um, and which, you know, has to do with privilege, social privilege. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I really like the video, this video. And then to me, I, I'm just really fascinated. One is like how simple it is, because there's just this, I'm really clean images. How the images sort of like, um, not like, like, somehow they're just, they just indicate, you know, what you're talking about, the place you're talking about without like making it obvious. Like, you're not having, like, white people or black people when you're talking about them, which I think makes it, for me, makes it very compelling. 
<clears throat> do not have that obviousness linked to the images, but just sort of this image that makes me think about what you're thinking, what you're talking about without like, necessarily being the thing you're talking about. Uh -huh. And that means anything. And that's more like kind of like a formal think about the video, but I'm really drawn to that. Yeah. Yeah, I guess that comes a little bit from this different kind of process. Like, it's not like I'm setting out to, to make like an illustration of whatever concept, yeah. like a, a border issue, you know, like instead it's like reflecting on an experience and, and pulling some stuff out and putting ideas together, you know. It's like, I mean, I'm really interested in how this, these aren't the things I was thinking when I was there, you know. It's, yeah. it's fictionalized in that sense, you know, mm -hmm. or it's kind of this reflective kind of mode or looking back at time instead or, but right, they're kind of, yeah, it's because it's, I'm really glad I'm having these experiences now of working on these like feature film, more straightforward documentaries because as much as they frustrate me in some ways, like it's good to just have the experience of trying to make something more conventional, these other things I sent you because, because I am in that mode now of like, we need to put up the historical image of the Black Panther Party here, you know, like, and part of me is like, don't do it, you know, like, there must be better ways to say that, you know, but then again, it's like, no one else has put this together, let's put this together, you know, or just, this is still important, or there's just other things guiding decision making in these other, kind of, I keep talking about more straightforward documentaries I'm working on, which it's just a good experience to go through. I'm kind of excited to get through them in a way, but um, yeah, but I am thinking like that, and, and it's a lot harder for me to do that in a way. How do you go about making those statements? Or like, what what led you to that? To those specific statements? Good question. Well, I don't think the diaries are done. First of all. There's more to say. Um, I want to make uh, 50 states of whiteness. I want to make one in every state in the United States, and we'll see how that comes along. But um, and uh, but how I came. I mean, one thing is there's this development over time in it of the like kind of um, least uh, what what's the word? It goes for two from less to more intense. You know, like to these like as it gets into like, uh, you know, the last few. Like one is this kind of thing about police violence. The last thing, you know, being pulled over. And then the last few are about the TSA. You know, whereas the first ones are none. They're all really intense. I mean, it's just the idea was that it was kind of increasing over time. So that kind of dictated how I laid them out. I wanted it to grow. Um, and I mean, this and how I decided them. I mean, they all. The reason it looks simple is that, I mean, it comes from how much, like, reading and talking to people. I mean, so many of these are things people have actually said to me. I think that's an important thing that I should mention is that, like, these actually don't spring from my, like, enlightened head at all. Like, this comes from a lot of difficult conversations with people of color who tell me something about my own privilege I'm not realizing, you know? or. Um, either because I ask or because it comes up somehow or because we put ourselves in a kind of dialoguing environment where that's what's supposed to happen or, you know, like some discussion group or something. Um, so, or I've been reading the stuff. So, so it's like heavily indebted to like the knowledge that people of color share with white people like me. Like, and so a lot of it is, uh, that's, the, that's where I'm at to answer your question, you know, is like where I'm at with this project is like, now how do I address and represent that, you know, like that's actually a really important thing, like there's this way that this kind of is leaving out this big important part of the consciousness raising process, and so, um, so I'm working on that next, like how to, how to just represent that, you know, or, or communicate that, those vulnerable experiences, you know, or difficult moments of those kind of exchanges, um, so, like the university thing is like a graduate student told me that happens to him, you know. I was like, no shit, I had no, never thought about that, you know. I just go to school, I have my own issues, you know. Like, um, but uh, but yeah, just stuff like that. I don't know. So that's how I decided. I don't know. It was a long process. There's a lot of writing involved. Like, not all of my work involves that much writing, but some do. Like this, like 
if you really want to know the process, like, I mean, it's like sitting and writing on a notebook. You know, I'm playing with the words and how I'm going to lay them out. I'm really into you reading them in a certain cadence. And, you know. um, so it takes a while, but it's, it's kind of like writing a short essay or something. It just, you know. So when you, I mean, prior to like looking at like the, the whiteness in, in your work, um, would you say that your work prior to that point was was introspective, or was it just kind of like going out with a camera and just capturing what you could, looking for things that kind of delighted your senses or wh whatever? Um, and so, like, to what to what degree would you say that your work was socially engaged prior to this? Oh well, well, there. Uh, how to go into this? Socially engaged. I love people, um, and uh, it's always been. I mean, uh, I do. Like I'm extroverted and get a lot of energy from being with other people and talking to people. So um, I think before. Before white stuff, I was still trying to figure out ways to use cameras to like get people to hang out with me and do stuff with me. You know, I would involve friends and in productions where we do weird stuff. Used to be weirder. I used to make like poor movie-ish stuff or or strange surreal things. I mean, we're going way back now. You know, like to when I was in college and stuff. But um, so those were socially engaged, and I mean, a lot of movie-making projects are going to involve people. Yeah. But in terms of like addressing like some issue in the world, um, I've I've made movies about like uh, women's movement stuff. You know, I'm in 2007. I made a piece about early suffragettes in London. You know, and so but it's always been a thing. You know, of like having I've kind of had just a lot of interest in social movements and social movement activities in the U.S. mostly for a long time. Um, and I got kind of a sort of um, introduction to sort of Marxism and class analysis at a young age that has kind of been the, one of the first lenses I've been wearing, you know. And so, so in some ways, like, even exploring everyday life, like, the, like, stuff that makes us reproduce ourselves, like, brushing your teeth or making food, like, Actually, to me, that's like a kind of socially engaged thing still. It's like looking at the kind of labor or that goes like unrecognized, unrecorded, unpaid most of the time, you know, like all the kind of things that, I don't know, to me, that's a kind of feminist agenda thing, you know, of like let's try to actually make this invisible work that's being done all the time, like more visible. That's another kind of conversation, I guess, you know, but, but like, um, but I mean, I just wasn't really able or interested in like getting like do stuff I was doing as an activist wasn't making its way into my artwork for a long time until maybe the past few years. Um, and I think that's just because there's a lot to learn, you know. Like to me, like I needed to spend a long time in like social movement cultures and activist cultures and stuff before I could really start to seek for it or um, about what was going on in any of those scenes I was a part of, you know. Um, so it's not really only recently that I felt able to do that. There's just, it takes a long, a lot of stuff takes a long time. That's my big message to you today, is that a lot of stuff can take years to, you know. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I've been thinking about this a lot as I think about, like, how could I develop a class about art and activism or something? I mean, certainly you could do it, you know, but one of the big things is that it's going to take a long time to build any relationships, to understand your own politics around something, you know. So you can certainly still make a 10 week or somehow. You can make some posters or something, you know. But, like, but to really have some, like, in-depth, lasting engagement with any kind of socially engaged thing you're going to be part of, that is, I think, just takes a really long time. Um, but in one sense. In another sense, stuff can go really rapidly. Like, do you guys remember when we were going to go on strike, like, last week? Like, to me, that was a fascinating moment in our history here at PSU. It felt like every day was, like, a year, you know? Like, for me, anyway, as somebody who is really, like, sort of 
engaged with the strike activity and was like excited about this possibility of like a big group of people coming together to do something that would benefit like all of them and like you know and sort of assert something together was I've never been a part of something that had that many hundreds of people involved um, and so and it did feel like wow actually things could move rapidly in a way I'm, t I'm talking about some weird stuff here like <laughs> being engaged for a long time but yet at the same time consciousness can shift quickly I think is what I'm saying like like anyone who's was around Occupy stuff you know Minds can change pretty quick. Like once once we stop thinking about iPads for a second, you know, like we can suddenly have all this attention to give to like what's actually going on in our world. And so, so in some senses, you don't have to be engaged with something for years. But for me, in order to make art about something, I had to kind of stick around in it for years. And I'm still grappling with how to do that, really. You know, how to do that well, or if we need, if that's what the world needs. You know, it's, um, but it's also like. I like the way it kind of more just comes up in my own daily life stuff, you know, like it's just what I'm doing, so it comes up in the art stuff. Other, these other documentary projects I'm working on are more consciously like, I'm making art about these social movements now, you know, so. Okay, yeah. two questions that are not super well formulated, but one I could be about ritual and like, it seems like the minute long videos are like really it works for you, and I've been trying to do this writing ritual that's like some days I just don't get to it, and I was wondering how, like if you just, by the end of the day, some days you're like, yeah. oh, I didn't do it, and like how it integrates into your life and uh, other ways of like, I guess just like being intentional versus mm -hmm. kind of like having it just happen naturally. Yeah. And then along those same lines, um, having like a bunch of raw footage and then something kind of morphing out of that versus like deciding to do something. And I know you told me that you like the editing process, mm -hmm. but um, just like being extroverted and then like that piece seems like a totally different piece and like how that works together for you in terms of like then, I mean, do you enjoy the shooting more? Does it feel like I don't know, just how you how you experience that mm -hmm. and think about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a bunch of questions. I guess the first one is about doing it every day or not. Yeah, I don't always do it. It's the truth, um, and I don't beat myself up about it. Um, and uh, and that's kind of one of the rules. Is like I'm gonna be chill about this. You know, I try to catch up the next day. You know, do two or something. Um, but yeah, I mean it's that's it's kind of well that's part of what it's for is like for me to be able to look at my life and be like what's going on why am I so sleepy how come like ten days in a row it was just brushing teeth like we gotta that's that says something to me about like how I'm like way over scheduled or way over but you know or just or you know or just not engaged with like with every day and so. So it's kind of good for that, um, and that does happen. Like right now, I'm in one of those periods where, like, a, a really fun period thing I do is go through, like, back them up on a hard drive and label them all by the date, and that's like this way for me to be like, oh, I remember Johnny's birthday party, you know, or whatever, and I get to go through it all, and um, and I haven't done that for like several months. Like that's like a like sign that I haven't made a few hours for myself to do this thing I really love, and it's like. Just important information, you know. Um, so yeah, that's the first question. And the second question was what were you talking about? I'm just like uh, I don't know, I was talking here about this, but just simplifying and like I guess like so do you feel like when you're just when you're shooting all this raw footage you don't really know what what how does the experience differ when you're like know that you're making something and that's what you're doing and like maybe it changes based on the process or if you are just like getting, getting footage or whatever mm -hmm. your process is of maybe it's not fun, but whatever it is mm -hmm. and you're just doing it and then later you're deciding what to do with it. Like how does that differ for you and what do you see as the benefits of these different approaches? Yeah. yeah. Um Hmm. Well, 
Well, I really like, um, I mean, hmm, how to say this? I guess since I mentioned, like, I have been working on projects that are a little more structured, where we know there's certain shots we want to get, and these ones involve deep collaboration, which might be interesting for us to talk about, too, since you guys are collaborators sometimes, you know. Um, the other ones I'm talking about, these more straightforward documentaries. Um, and just what the difference is like, I mean, I guess one, one thing I can say that is, like, hopeful for things is, like, I feel like having done this for so long, like, been engaged in this process of, like, I'm, I'm just going to not worry about what this shot, like, is for, I'm just going to shoot stuff, and that kind of stuff, has made me really, like, chill about things, you know? Like, things are going to work out. We're going to have a movie in the end. There's always something in there. Don't worry about it, you know? And this is something I've found working with collaborators who um, have a lot, like, are a little more worried, you know, who haven't had as much experience. I've been working with activists on one project who've never made a film before, you know, and so, and they're like, well, we need all this stuff, you know, they're just sort of more worried about stuff, and and I'm just kind of like, hey, dudes, it, there's, it'll work out, just, just, just stay, stay strong, you know, and there's just, and I think that just comes from me having years of, like, that made stuff out of nothing, you know, stuff that's not supposed to be anything. It's just like sort of banal everyday stuff. There's all, there's still something in there all the time. I think there's everywhere you are, there's plenty to say about where you are, and so, um, so that's like one effect I guess it's had. If that makes sense. I mean, I don't know. All these modes have their benefits, you know, like people who script out a whole thing and have like storyboards and actors. I mean, that's seems very like all planned and stuff to me and that seems maybe like less fun but there's actually even within that much structure and stuff there's always room for play and improv too like those guys are can break their own rules while they're in the process and I don't know every process has potential Does that make sense yeah, yeah I did the neighbor piece I didn't see it all but did you um, uh, did you plan that or did you start just talking like the neighbors that you did interview, did uh -huh. you Mr. interview in the first, or did you have an idea? How I know that that's. I had no idea where that one's going. Yeah, <laughs> that one's like the ultimate like process. Yeah, that was. I didn't. I made that up as I went along. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's um, going back to your history of evolving and meeting with social issues. I'm I'm curious, and I attended an event that you hosted, I think, with Steve mm -hmm. Kurtz um, from Critical Art Ensemble. So I know that you studied with him. And right. I'm curious to know um, a little bit more about that experience and, and how that that shaped your involvement with activism yeah. Yeah, uh, politics great. more broadly. How did you know that, that that shaped my involvement? With, did I say that that well, night? No, I mean, I'm assuming. I'm assuming. Hands. I'm a little bit familiar yeah. with their work. Yeah, no, it's great. Yeah, but I, you know, obviously attended that yeah. conference. You talked about that. Event. Yeah. No, thanks for bringing that up. That's huge. Um, um, that was a hugely influential time in my life for getting more engaged with political life, you know. Um, yeah, I mean... I guess one way to describe my trajectory is that, like, I grew up in the suburbs and was, like, felt liberated by DIY culture and kind of um, underground music and art and film and video and stuff like that. Like, I, I was really connected to that stuff growing up on the East Coast, right? And that was a kind of, and still is, a kind of, like, political thing, you know, of, like, we're going to reject mainstream culture and stuff. I used to play music and stuff like that and be in bands. And, um, and, and I always was interested in, like, what activists were doing, people, like, saying stuff on the street, like, this is important, this is important. But I always found that to be kind of a turnoff, you know, like, it sort of seemed like just another loud voice yelling at me, you know, and I sort of never got involved with activism in college or anything. Um, and I always found like art communities to be a little like more sensitive and um, nice to me, and so um, so I kind of went those roads. But I was always really interested in what I mean. I had friends who were big activists on campus and stuff. I was always really interested in what they were doing. Um, but then I went to graduate school and I met this artist, Steve Kurtz, who was 
not actually in the program I was in. He was in the one next door. I went to a media study program, and he was in the art program. But was but I met was he? yeah yeah mm -hmm. 2003 is when I started grad school, and so. And I didn't know about his work before grad school, but when I got there, I went to go study like, you know, avant-garde film and documentary. I was really getting interested in too, because I was really interested in people. I love them and was interested in working with them. And so, but then I learned about Steve Kurtz's work and was like, wow, like he's part of this collective called Critical Art Ensemble. And was like, wow, they make like art and politics come together in a way that's actually like funny and smart. And I just, it was a really important thing for me to see that people could do this. You know, you didn't have to choose. You could actually bring them together, and and you didn't have to be a jerk. You know, <laughs> like you could also be, um, like he, you know, a lot of activists I had met at that time were kind of judgmental, and you know, and he was like a total, you know, sort of sweet person who was just taking people as they were, and you know, and I always felt like, I don't know, getting all choked up thinking about it. He was an important person for me to meet, for a figure, you know, to model that kind of behavior, really, and um, her way of being in the world. And then, but, you know, I, but I went through graduate school. It's like I did start to make a couple, some projects that were more like, like, these kind of um, performative interventions, or, you know, like I, Things that were more like the work he was doing. I did. A, I had a whole project called the Church of Julie Perini, where I would marry anybody to anything. This is right around 0304 when like uh, gay marriage was a new kind of news item or newish anyway. The idea that this should be something that everybody could have access to. So I was like, in my church, everyone can marry everyone, you know. And, um, and I used to do this whole project, you know. And so, so that was a way to, you know, that was the kind of work I was doing then. Um, but it just didn't always, it, it felt like a little too, yeah, I could go into why I moved away from that, but but I I enjoyed it while it lasted. And, and yeah, and so he's just sort of always been an important influence on me, too. And also um, Tony Conrad, who visited here a few weeks ago, who is most well known as this, like, avant-garde noise musician and structural filmmaker from the 60s. And but he also a lot of people don't know that like he kind of ducked out of the art world for a few decades. He was living in Buffalo. He still teaches in Buffalo. He's like Steve's hero. Um, he did like public access like media cool stuff like all kinds. Of, you know, not everybody knows about this stuff. He and so when I met him, he was at that same time. He was another big influence on me as somebody who wasn't making a choice to do like art or politics, but was kind of like, I'm going to do some projects that are completely abstract, weird noise stuff where I play a piece of string, you know, and then I'm going to do other stuff that is like completely like a community media project where we ask people on the street what's wrong with the city, you know, like you just wasn't, these things weren't exclusive, you know, and so, so yeah, so both those guys were, were helpful to me, yeah, but so that was, yeah, great to be able to bring him last year here to talk to us. There's more to that, of course. There's the whole FBI thing. So that's another, if anyone wants to know about the FBI, I can tell you. But a lot of you guys have heard about it. So, um, yeah. Could you talk about the, um, the piece that you made after your statement was done, which I had in Spain until you sent it recently, um, where you're like, Revisiting your like how you think about Portland now after making oh, the whole yeah. documentary about mm -hmm. police brutality and mm -hmm. it's a really beautiful piece. So I guess I'm just curious in general about your relationship with making Safe and Sound and then making this other yeah. piece. Yeah. Reflecting on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. I just finished that like a month or two ago. Um, I guess. Yeah, what you're talking about is this one I called Impressions of Portland, um, which is sort of a pun, you know, impressions on the street. Yeah. Um, um, so where are we with that? Well, there's a few things to say. One thing is that during the making of Safe and Sound, which is this documentary about police brutality in the city, um, I did this thing by myself. I mean, I'm working on it with two other collaborators really closely, but one thing I did alone was this um, 
16 millimeter film technique. Do people all see this? Where where you can you can take 16 millimeter film and you can put it places like that have some texture to them, and you can like rub on it so that you get that texture impression on the film, right? This exists in other art forms, I'm sure, in other ways too, you know, but you can then, what I did was digitize that film. Um, oh, and what I did was I went to a few of the sites that we were talking about in our documentary about police violence, like places where stuff has happened, and I went by myself to spend time there and just understand those places, what they're like now, and one thing I did was bring film and make these like impressions of the streets there, the sidewalks there. That's what you're talking about. And it just always felt like we put those in the documentary, but we never, like, talked about what they, like, were, you know? They're just this scratchy material that goes by and adds a kind of aesthetic element, but that's about it. And so I always felt like I wanted people to know what that was. But it's kind of a complicated process. It just took me, like, 30 seconds to tell you this, you know? And so it kind of... So I made my own piece about it, since that had been sort of something I did on my own. I just um, took that film material, and often with the daily video thing, I often it often documents the process of making other artworks, you know, like that one. I documented the process of like actually scratching those things. It's not like I went back, like I just happened to have it in my archives. And so I just put together a piece that's kind of like the White Lady Diaries with the text, just telling you a little bit about what it was like, the kind of transformation I went through and to, of even working on this thing and how I think about the city differently now and stuff. Yeah. This seemed like a lot. I mean, Safe and Sound is a great documentary, but it, it doesn't have my story in there. Like, no one knows about how Julie Perini feels. And so I felt like I needed to make my own piece to talk about this other thing that is, I think, really important. I mean, it's something I think about about documentary makers all the time. It's like, well, what what has it been like for you to go through all of this, you know, like this, you, you're going to change if you work on a project, any project really, you know, but but most, a lot of documentaries like act like they're not part of it or, you know, they're just telling, letting, they're channeling all these stories, you know, and in this case, since I'm working with collaborators, I decided to let it be that channeling of stories, but I'll make some of my own, like tell you a little bit more about what it's like to do that, I don't know. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you talk about safe and sound and how like your relationship with your partners? Like who is involved beyond you and Jody and your person? Yeah. And like how how does that relationship look like in terms of like what kind of input you get from them, what kind of decisions they make? Mm -hmm. So how's that relationship? You should probably look for that because I said this kind of is it the mic? Yeah. Oh, so it's okay to do that? Um. How are you guys all doing? You all right? Conversation series? Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's getting it's, uh, a lot. Um, that's a great question that is probably relevant to the types of projects you guys are engaged with. Um, um, so our relationship to community partners, this is big. Um, so Safe and Sound came out of, again, at working in communities in Portland who, working with people who were already working on police violence issues, you know? Like, before I made any movie about anybody, I was just sort of going to protest, learning about the issue in the community for a long time. I mean, long time meaning a couple years. That started in, like, 2010. And so, so I was meeting people who were already on this and had been for decades, some of them, you know. Um, and so, and just meeting people, building relationships, and eventually, like, I started to want to use, like, the skills and interests I have to add to this sort of movement around police brutality in the city. And so I started the project. And, yeah, I mean, some of the community partners have been key to the whole thing, you know. Like... If you're going to make documentaries where you need interview subjects, you need access to people, you know? You need people to, like, trust that you're someone who gets them or isn't going to exploit them or, you know. And so, so like, for example, Joanne Hardesty is a woman in the community who's been working on police accountability stuff for many decades in this city. And she's in there a bunch of times, yep. And so getting connected to her was the way I got connected to 
a bunch of other stuff. Like, like basically, like she's connected to um, some of the families uh, who've lost loved ones, um, and so those are people who are kind of hard to access. But, but she was like, well, you know, like if you want, I can get them to be interviewed and all that stuff, you know, and she was there for those interviews and, you know, so she was a kind of really key person that, that really, like, for a while we were working on that project without, we were like, God, you know, we'd really like to get to know if people who have, you know, some of these memorial stories we're talking about, but um, we were not, how do we tell those stories without, like, voices of people who are actually affected? Um, and we were thinking about doing it, though, other ways, you know. There are other ways, like yeah, my voice, anybody's voice can tell these stories, you know. It's different from having an interview subject tell their own story. Um, but so she actually, meeting, getting to know her and having her connect us was huge. Um, yeah, there's, there's more to say about some of this stuff. But what do you mean exactly? Like, do you want to know about continuing relationships or... How do you navigate that? Boundaries, like. No, or, I guess. Um, yeah. I guess it's what kind of input they provide. You know. What oh, uh -huh. Because um, like, like how how much, like in which places you're making room for them to make decisions. Yeah. About what the final product? If, if you are mm -hmm. letting that happen, you know, because if it's not possible, maybe it's not the kind of. Work. Like relationship they want to have, you know, maybe they just want to give you the company right. and you do whatever you want. Right. They are happy with whatever they get. They right. trust you. You know, get something good. Mm -hmm. But maybe not. Maybe you are like asking more, and and see how that goes. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess that, that's why. Yeah. No, that's an interesting question. Yeah. And there's different schools of thought on this. I can tell you what we've been doing with that one project. I mean, some. Some people are so engaged in like participatory documentary making that they will make, you know, they will sit with their interview subject through the entire editing process, and they're kind of just as much a part of, just as much a part of it. And um, but then, like you say, some people don't want to be; they just want to do their interview and like not have to do more work, you know. <laughs> and so, um, and um, so in our case, it's been mostly that people have. Um, yeah, kind of given us the interview, and they haven't been very long interviews, so it's sort of, we use a lot of what they give us, so it's um, mostly been in that kind of process where we go edit it. But there are these other more subtle things, like like some community groups uh, that we've been involved with for this project will ask us to do other media things. Like, hey, you know how to do media stuff. Like, you could come document our event. You could help us get these other testimonials we need for some other court case, or you know, like stuff like that. And that's an interesting moment, you know, to like figure out like, like how far does like, you know, do I have time right now? You know, like how far does my commitment go into this movement? You know, um, stuff like that. So mostly, I'm happy to give back when I can. You know, um, and also I partly engage in these projects just to learn about the whole issue and problem. So the more I can learn, the better. You know, even if it's not officially for the documentary I'm making, if I can go help them out on another event. It always informs what I'm going to do back on our documentary, you know. Um, so, but that's, I think it's a really interesting thing. Uh, I mean, I've worked with documentary subjects who get very attached, you know, just personally. Um, they want to hang out for coffee, you know, or just like do. And there's a way you want to continue that relationship. You don't want it to just be this one-off. Like I got my interview from you. That's it. But then I've had people show up in the middle of the night at my door, need money, and you know, <laughs> like there's ways that you have to. You just have, I think it's a fascinating thing that most documentary makers aren't talking about, or as far as I know, like how you, like what intimacy means for during interviewing and what relationship building or ending <laughs> means <laughs> with the interview with the you know documentary subjects you're working on, so working with. Um, I mean, there's there's old school hard line like just get the interview and go home. You know, there's like this journalistic kind of approach. You know, um, but I think yeah, I'm, that's not the way I work on things. But then again, like uh, yeah, there, there's more to say on that. But does that answer some of your questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how 
it's no like with that project we made this whole version like we are going to make a collection of short videos about police violence in Portland Oregon and then we finished an hour of that you know we've got a bunch of short stories and we're like the way maybe a lot of people get when you finish something you're like if only I'd also added all these other things then it would be perfect you know um, and we were in that spot with it where it felt like we could see the potential for it to be just a bit more than it was and we weren't sure if we were going to continue working on it but we applied for one of the precipice grants that they had this year and we said hey will you let us add another like half hour and make this like a feature film, not just a short collection of videos or micro documentaries on a website, but like make it a real feature. It'll have history, it'll have drama, it'll have, you know what I mean? It'll have, um, and they said yes. So that's where we are. That, like just this past weekend, we did five more interviews um, and trying to fill in a couple of holes that we see in the overall story we're telling. Yeah, yeah. we're going to make a nice little DVD that has a discussion guide inside. That's something we're working with community partners on, is like to get feedback on what they think a discussion guide should have in it. Um, and then, because some feedback we've gotten already is that, you know, community groups want to use this media to like instigate conversations about police brutality and so on, but, um, but not everybody has a fast internet connection, especially in like a church basement where a lot of these things happen, you know, and so so the idea of even having a DVD is helpful for a lot of community people. Um, and so that's, and then how it's going to be distributed, yeah, like we're talking about that now, like, I mean, depending, I don't, it could go a lot of ways. It could become something that is distributed by, I mean, this is kind of uh, detail stuff, but like there, there's there's film distributors out there like Third World Newsreel. There's these different like people who distribute social justice films, and so something like this could fit in there. Um, so there's that kind of thing. And what about like, like organized? I mean, I know that screenings sometimes community screenings are kind of the most um, common venue mm -hmm. for like films of this type. But I'm just wondering if there ways in which the community partners have thought how they can use oh, yeah. material like this, especially like, you know, like, if you want, like, you know, like, superficial, like, you see these, how I know. you get them to see something like yeah. this. Oh yeah, so this is a very strange project to work on in the sense of it being done, but then not done again, you know, like, like we're screening it and having community dialogue events with like the Human Rights Commission and all kinds of stuff in Portland even though we're kind of like well, we're not really done yet you know but there's this way it's like well if you want to have that conversation now you should use the media we have now like we don't need to wait you know and there's something about that that feels like located in community organizing you know like we're not going to wait a year for the perfect film you know if we have something for you to use now use it you know um, but right, it already has been used by some of the groups and organizers we're connected to. It, it shows more than I know. Like I get emails from community groups who haven't even told me they're using it, and saying, "Come to the screening tonight." And I'm like, "Thanks," just because I'm on their PCAST and like their email list or something. And um, so, because we just have it streaming online, um, I like the aspect of it being short pieces on all these different pages for that reason. Like because if it, group wants to focus on a particular type of story in their discussion that night, they can tailor their own little screening of 20 minutes or something. They don't have to screen the whole thing. Like, I think it has, like, the website is much more of, like, an organizing tool um, than the kind of feature documentary is. But then the feature documentary thing could go further, you know, it could go beyond Portland um, and get other people talking about it more. We're definitely in a time when people are open to talking about it, it seems, in public ways, talking about um, policing in their communities and safety issues, it seems like. But yeah, it's this, that's, I have this interesting like distance on it, like watching the way this film is working out in the world and seeing how organizers use it. And it's been really interesting to see how people are work using it, like without me. You know, all the other stuff, like, you know, I don't know, art galleries, film festivals, there, you know, there's 
community is interested in like the diary stuff and stuff like that. But to see something that is really being used, like just taking on a life of its own, because people really want to talk about this and learn about this, is has been really fascinating and good. Yeah. yeah. Like one of the requirements of the Precipice Fund was to <laughs> show <laughs> that somehow your project was going to benefit other artists. Yeah. So why did you stay to show that finishing this oh. film was going to benefit <laughs> other artists? Um, well, I mean. That's great. That's funny. Yeah. I don't remember exactly what I said, but I think we said so. First of all, it kind of totally is. Like, because we first showed it at an art gallery, all these art and film people I know who are mostly white people who aren't so politically engaged would come up to me and be like, people need to know, Julie. We need to, everyone needs to see this movie, you know? And I'd be like, yeah, I know, you know? It was like the opening night that we had, we showed it at Place Gallery um, on a loop. That's where we showed last year the first iteration of Safe and Sound. Um, it was fascinating because like my political friends came and my art friends came and the art people were totally shocked and like, you know, which is great. They're shook up, you know? Um, they're seeing a side of their city they hadn't seen before. But then political friends came, and they would say they watch the whole thing, and they'd be like, "I really like the like uh, backgrounds you put the interview subjects on." <laughs> you know, like they totally had comments about just they were not phased by any of the content. You know, they've been working in this stuff for their whole lives, and so you know, um, very different responses. You know, um, from outrage to like I don't know a kind of you know distance resignment. You know, <laughs> like. Um, so, uh, yeah, so right, so we said it was going to like help, you know, with the political development of some artists' consciousness, you know, I mean, I think, I think it did, I think it still does, and, um, and also to, like bring art and activist communities together a little bit more. Um, I think it has also done that at the different kinds of events it shows that, um, so that's a good question. That's, we took that kind of literal, you know, this is what is going to be the impact on the artist. So it's good to just know how people just talk about things. It's kind of what we're going to be doing for the rest of our life. Right, right. <laughs> it is a really good question. It's a new, I haven't seen that on tons of applications. That's, that's an interesting yeah. one. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it's a good question. Yeah. So, how long do you guys converse normally? <laughs> An hour or two? Uh-huh. <laughs> Are there other questions? Um, in, in talking about how you were <clears throat> capturing videos of kind of like little everyday things that you do that could basically be seen as like unpaid for mm -hmm. activities and work, mm -hmm. I was watching this this video where Peter Sellers was talking to a, to a group, this edible education class down at Berkeley, and he was talking about the things that you are inherently that you don't get paid for that you do every day, mm -hmm. and um, and so I've just been thinking about this idea, and thinking about there there's so many artists that want to represent these things that we do that and say, well I don't get paid for this you know like. Uh, Mir uh, what's her name? The mural is ukulele. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and so part of me thinks like this is valuable criticism. But uh, Peter was also mentioning in his talk to this class that like so many people are just saying are are criticizing a system and saying here's what I'm against. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think of when I see a lot of that kind of critical art, critical of the capitalist system. Mm -hmm. And I think what I find really interesting in, in artworks is when an artist tells me what they're for or mm -hmm. what they're in favor of. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's how I've kind of been thinking about the things that I, I want to do, mm -hmm. or I, the, the, the things that I do like in my daily life mm -hmm. that I want to include or maybe contextualize as an, as an art practice, mm -hmm. you know? Um, for example, like I was, my, my wife had to go do some work the other day and so I was watching my baby and I thought, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to take my baby outside with me and I'm going to like sit him down in the garden 
while I do my gardening, and I'm just going to let him get as dirty as he wants to get. And I thought about, like, maybe I should, like, be photographing this, because I'm trying to, like, you know, I'm trying to be artistic with my life in that I want to instill my values into my children. And I figure if I can just get them out and have them be in a place where they're enjoying themselves, doing the thing that I get to do that I enjoy, that that's, mm -hmm. that's a good artistic practice. Mm -hmm. So... Um, so kind of in thinking about like these videos that you're shooting, um, what what do you what do you feel like you're you're actively saying that you're for in in the making of of your movies? In making movies, that's a great question. What do, um, yeah. What are you for? I want people to think <laughs> a lot, you know. Um, Bye. Bye. I have a meeting. I'm trying to stay. I'll watch the recording. <laughs> yeah. Like, uh, yeah, for people sort of thinking critically and actively in a way that is pleasurable, even if it's uncomfortable, you know? Like, it's kind of it's something I'm trying to develop an idea around lately, you know? Is that just that there is a kind of human, I think, joy in inquiry and in knowledge discovery and things like that, even if it is uncomfortable or difficult or challenging or some, what you thought before, you know? So so if I could get people to, like, get on board with me there, that would be great. I think the world would be an interesting place. Um, so that's so that, what I'm, that free inquiry between people or... Or yeah, or an individual with themselves, for sure. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm for. Um, yeah, I mean the thing about um, there, there's a uh, theorist I'm interested in named Silvia Federici. I'm not sure if you're familiar with her work, but she um, she and a lot of other Marxists have this term they use called social reproduction. That's what I'm talking about, about like the everyday life activities, like which basically encompasses like the whole range of activities that humans do to reproduce themselves. So being in school, I mean, is even one of you know the fact that like you know we reproduce the culture in school, like we train the next generation of people in the knowledge that we've managed to get a hold of, and you know, and so on. Um, all of that is part of like social reproductive activities. It, reproduces the culture and the society. So um, so Silvia Federici is somebody who is really involved in like the second wave feminist movement, women's movement, was someone who was like using this like sort of theoretical framework to talk about how um, like basically like things that were seen at that are now seen as completely radical ideas, like that there should be wages for housework was something that she was kind of using her theories about, you know, this whole system of, um, you know, capitalist domination exploitation is based on, you know, uh, exploited labor in all kinds of spheres, but let's not forget about in domestic spheres where it's completely free, you know, and made to seem natural, you know, taking care of other people and all of that stuff is just something like, in most, for the most part, women are just good at, you know. And then you can see how that comes up in other spheres too. It comes up in all kinds of workplaces here, or anywhere, you know. Like when that kind of like reproductive labor of just taking care of things, you know, like putting on events, making sure everybody's okay, is often something that women are tasked to do. And we still have this, you know. Like this is a longer conversation, but like so. The idea that, um, I don't know where I was going with this, but just trying to notice it more, you know, like, so the idea that, like, I would make videos about things that are mundane or banal or something like that, um, I'm not, like, saying, like, we should be paid to make coffee for ourselves in the morning, you know, so much as just sort of trying to look at, like, like, like the where life's really happening, you know, like, is it really, like, like with your kid, I mean, that's a beautiful thing, like, values are getting trans through these activities that seem small but are actually really huge, you know? Um, and so it's not just like the big moments when you go and do something public or political, but also all these other moments are just as meaningful and important. You know? yeah. so. 
Yeah, I'm glad you brought back that term of social reproduction mm -hmm. uh, that you mentioned again, because that actually slipped out of my mind when mm -hmm. I first said it earlier today. Because it's just the thought, I was reading, like, someone had posted this, this thing this morning about some woman from the GOP saying that women need to be paid less so that they can get married, like some ridiculous article. And then, of course, there's this long firestorm of responses. And I was like, this is just like one of those internet troll articles. Like, yeah. all it is there for is just to, like, get people angry and upset yeah. because very few people probably believe it. Mm -hmm. But it's, like, the, the bigger issue for me is that I just... It's like if, if a problematic system exists, like capitalism, I think... I, just, I guess I'm just maybe personally turned off by art that says, well, let's take capitalism yeah. to the extreme. Like, it has a value in that, like, it's a good critique of why it's so messed up. But at the same time, it's, I don't know, it's like when a horror film goes too far and, like, they're showing, like, people getting sawed in half. You're like, oh, okay, this is just too much. Like, mm -hmm. let's just focus on the things that we want as opposed to the things that are really fucking everything up. So, mm -hmm. yeah, so I don't know. But, yeah, yeah, I hear you. It can be really shallow, you know, in its, like, stance on things, you know, like, capitalism's just bad, you know, without really helping us understand anything new about it, or, um, yeah. so, yeah. Maybe it's more like, converse about Marx. <laughs> <laughs> I can say something about Marx. Like, uh, Engels actually also wrote about that, too. Yeah, right. You know, like, back in the 1860s mm -hmm. or whatever, about, uh, you know, families in the United States. Yeah. I haven't read it. Yeah, you're right. yeah. <laughs> she didn't come up with the term. You know, it's an older term. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, think, I don't know. Kind of stemming off of um, Jeff's question of you know documenting your child, like playing in the garden and stuff. Like, at what point, like value-wise, for as like um, an art piece, like you have these pieces that are being shown in the gallery and, and you know, these paintings or whatever, and they're worth you know, X amount of money, but then you have, like, pictures of, you know, your kid that me is sentimental to you personally, obviously because it's your child, but then, like, how is it being received within a context outside of that immediate uh, intimate group? Um, how do you kind of work through that in your own process mm -hmm. and um, I mean as a person though like the value I think it's cost wise I think they're amazing and both equal but they're different in art world or um, society even uh -huh. so how do you like kind of navigate like you have these very personal moments of your right. you know one minute um, videos but you know why should somebody who doesn't even know who you are care that you're brushing your teeth. Yeah. Like, and I know you kind of contextualize that with saying, mm -hmm. you know, uh, as the piece as a whole, but yeah. you, know, if you can just, like, address that mm -hmm. a little bit. Yeah, that's a great, that's, that's like, every grad student should always ask, I guess. <laughs> so, like, why should someone else care about any of the, you know, or just any artist should ask mm -hmm. about Not because I'm trying to be critical, no. just, like, as a... Yeah, no, that's a great question. What your I mean, one is. thing is just, like, it's just a weird, I guess I'm winding down here, it's getting more casual. I mean, like, I never, I didn't, this thing about, like, art world and galleries and price tags, like, I don't come out of that world, really. I'm interested in it, kind of, intrigued, like, but, um, but like I was mentioning, like, I kind of have much more of a background in, like, this art making was like for my community, you know, like for my, like when I did music, it was like you make music for the other bands that you're friends with who come to the show, you know, there was this kind of feedback thing that happens or community building thing that happens. And so when I started making films and videos, it was also kind of like my first venues were all the same clubs that I would go to see shows at, you know, like we put on screenings and stuff like that. It was all very much self-initiated and so, so in a way like, yeah, there was this kind of closer connection. Like, I knew the audience, who more or less, who was seeing whatever I was doing when I was younger. Mm -hmm. And then, as I got older, it just started to become an interesting thing to start to think about how things I was making could connect beyond, like, my own interpersonal connections. Like, wow, there actually are people, like, across the country who might like to see this 
video I made because I'm exploring X, Y, Z, that they're also like we're communicating on this other in this other way. You know, that's not about who we are and where we are in our city, but is instead about some common interests we have that are about like the things I was talking about. You know, like editing, like filmmakers. You know, like they also want to see it because we're in conversation. You know, so that was an interesting moment when that happened. You know, this big shift. You know, in realizing that. There's these different kinds of audiences, you know, um, the ones that are known to you, the ones that are just interested in this field. You know, it is like a field or a profession or whatever people want to call it. And so, so then I just started to be more open to. But that was a weird moment. It felt alienating, like the idea that someone would watch something that I made and I don't even know them or get to talk to them about it. You know. Um, but then there's also this special connection you have with that stranger that you'll never meet, you know, where you kind of touch them and, and that's it, you know. And so I don't know if that really gets at what you're talking about. I went down a different the audience road, but audience is a really important question and how. Yeah, no, it, you know, yeah. And, uh, no, it's good. Um, shoot, I had a follow up question that just. Uh, Put the camera on you. That might help. Yeah, that might help. <laughs> That's exactly what I was thinking. Um, <clears throat> no, not to really go. <laughs> I mean, there, there there are examples of um, everyday life work that also fits into those high art realms, paintings and right. photographs and films right. that are about everyday life. But like, why do those ones? get into galleries and not saying that I want my work necessarily to be in the galleries, but why are those Well this that's a bigger question. Like an interesting question, but I don't know if it's is it because are you saying why as opposed to what? Like what is it that's that's supposed to be in the gallery? Or should is it like normal in the gallery and then what's not? It's just the question I know, but <laughs> like, I, I'm just saying it kind of leads to a bunch of other yeah, things. Yeah. Which is important. Like yeah. And interesting. I mean, I think maybe, like, it's kind of like, like, some people say things to me about, like, home movies. Like, why should I watch your home movie? You know, which is kind of what you're saying about toothbrushing or something. Um, or this comes up in the diary communities I'm a part of, you know, where some people get criticized for making glorified home movies or something. Um, and so, and, you know, I don't think there's, like, ever become a definitive answer to why some gets in and some is out, you know. Yeah. But there is this thing about craft, you know. Like, yeah. like you, you know, the same person can take a pile of video, let's say, and shape it into something that communicates something, and then someone else can take it and shape it into something, and it's just not really communicating much, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just going to be subjective, you know. Some people will like this one and not that. I mean, that's where things get all complicated. But, but you can't. All of these art forms have, like you mentioned, painting and photography. Like, you know, there's stuff you can learn about them that allows you to communicate in a way that is different from the way you communicate with words, and can communicate more in a lot of ways. Um, that I think I, I don't know how to paint or draw, but I have like all this respect for people who do that because they can like shape materials from the real world and say things that I just don't know how to do. Like I think it's it's fascinating that they like or they can they know their body and mind. Like they're doing this real mind body melding thing. Mm -hmm. So much of like the way we're taught in schools these days is about separating those two, and I think that a lot of artists are really bringing them together in a way that is interesting, really almost impossible. And so, so I don't I guess there's just this, to bring back some formal level, like, like some people are just like shaping material into something that is actually, uh, you know, different from just looking at it without any shaping that's happened to it, you know. Um, it's like the ready-made thing, you know. I don't know what to say about that kind of art stuff, you know, about, that's a whole other thing. <laughs> Like when you just put ready-made stuff in the gallery, you know, like because that that gets to that same question, like why should I watch your home movie? Why should I look at your egg beater you put in the gallery? You know, like all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Those are difficult well, and I guess, questions. And it also kind of stems to like this idea of um, like living uh, living art or like the every the daily life or the everyday becoming like a piece of art and. Uh, and like, why does somebody who's making coffee or uh, 
know, where does that divide come between this is not art and this is art? I think it's mostly just intention or framing. If the if the person who's called the artist says it's art, what else? What else is there? I think mean, I think it's an interesting question. Yeah. I, I just in my own practice, that's like kind of something that I've done. There's, there isn't any sort of intrinsic way we can determine what art is and what is, and it's a construct. So it actually, nothing is art. It's just, you know, that's just a term that gets applied to things. And there are institutions that sort of signify what art is, but they're also, even within the institution, you can look and see something that wasn't considered art at some point, and now it is, or the other way around. Oh, it turns out it's a Rembrandt forgery. Let's get it out of here. But the last like 50 years, we've been like praising it and having illuminated experiences in front of it or something like that. You know, like there's all sorts of crazy things like that uh, that point to the fact that art is just a construct and that, you know, and with Duchamp, you, it, you know, it's all of these things have been sort of blown out of the water so you can just, you have the right to say that something is or isn't. And if the institution chooses to collect it, then you've like effectively convinced them, I guess. And there's lots of reasons that might or might not help you do that, you know. But I think that, and then, then that goes for everything, whether it's somebody brushing their teeth or, or anything else, somebody making an abstract painting. Carol, are you talking about um, everything that's considered art being a part of that construct? Or, because I'm thinking of like, I think anything that gets time and attention from an individual, like a one on one to one ratio, has an element of art to it. Like if if I spend a lot of time focusing on how I'm raising like this one child or spend a lot of time writing this paper, I feel like I'm investing in the, the crafting of something, whether it's a person or time. <clears throat> and to me I think like that's where we get like the term artisan from. So are you are you taking the this whole concept of art as this construct is something separate from that? Or am I yeah, because then, you, know, you can choose to do that, right? Partly because you have that knowledge or whatever to, to call it that and think of it in those terms. A lot of other people also spend lots of time parenting their child or cooking their soup or gardening in the garden. But don't think of it art, right? And don't want to. They don't have any sort of real use for it. So once again, it it's the same activity, but it's a, it's it's intention and framing. It's, n it's nothing intrinsic about what those things are, right? And so, yeah, I would say that it's the exact same about everything. Any 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 piece of art in an institution, it's the same. It, it, it's also just it's just it's part of a construct. The framing, the yeah, it just got framed in a way that has become sort of like typified. So we don't we don't question it. It's but it, ultimately it's the same thing. And hence we get to name what becomes the next relevant art as individuals. <laughs> We, well, get I mean, to, well, we get to say what has value to you us. You can see over, you know, like in the 20th century, how that has sort of changed. And the Impressionists were, their work was considered not art. It was horrible. It was too loose and messy. It was about everyday things, right, and all right. sorts of stuff like like that. And so it's rejected. And and then of course now it's like the height of what we think of, what society thinks of as art in the most sort of general kind of way, and right. it's you know, automatically accepted in that, in that way. Nobody's questioning it anymore. Right. And then if you look at a million other things that occurred, sort of art movements or ready-mades or um, photography, video, performance, social practice, any of those things, they've all sort of gone through some sort of process of resistance, rejection, acceptance, normalcy, or something like that. Yeah. And yeah, so that'll continue. So we can also just look at it and be like, yeah, that seems to be the process that that art things go through um, in, in our society and in our institutions. Yeah. And sometimes it's accelerated and sometimes it's not. And yeah. Sometimes there's a way, you know, ch somebody that champions it and makes it an easier entry. Other things that have much longer time. Or maybe never make it in, but it's not really, it's, it's circumstantial. It's not that because, once again, because of like the intrinsic quality of it or something. There's probably like all kinds of things we don't think of as art and don't have as precedence just because they never made it into that. But somebody did it with that, you know, intention maybe. Mm -hmm. We just don't know about it. Um, I'm interested in, like, I think um, sort of one of the stems of the question was about value, right? In terms of, like, how do we value things and how is something, uh, you know, something like my relationship to my family 
and that is valuable to me, and how is that valuable to anybody else? And unlike whether it's art or not, the question of value doesn't have to be binary, right? Um, and the thing that I'm most excited about these days is thinking about um, use, usefulness or functionality, and how how does my artwork function for somebody else? Like, if like I have a portrait of my family and I frame it and I hang it beside my bed, it, it's like it you know it has a great sort of function as an aesthetic object or as an as an object generally, you know, for me. But it wouldn't have that function for, in a gallery for somebody else. It might have some sort of other function. Mm -hmm. um, and this is as actually like a Marxist term too of, of use use value. Mm -hmm. um, uh, as being sort of a precursor to what he called exchange value, um, being like how much, yeah, as a commodity, as an object, how you trade it. Um, but for me, that's like what becomes interesting in terms of like whether this art object or this sort of project um, transcends my sort of personal and in terms of like drawing on my own life, my own experiences. Um, for a research or an art project to then become something that I want to share with somebody else, uh, audiences or something. When you think about usefulness, are you thinking in very practical terms, in terms of like the way we use a cup, the way we use, like in the way we we use stuff to fulfill our survival and most basic needs? Or um, what? Marx does, for sure. When he talks about commodities, he talks about... Well, I'm um, talking about Marx. I'm talking about you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> for me, I'm including usefulness as um, also in terms of like this art object. Like, um, I mean, it can be like an art object can have a function of like filling my empty wall above my couch. Like, that's a real function. It's like, I actually have that problem now. Where it's like I don't actually have enough art objects in my room, and I've got this, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of like interior decor decoration. Like I think that that is a valid function. It can function as an artwork. Yeah, I mean, in the in the traditional sense, because like Rick Lowe, Project Row House, also an art project that happens to be fulfilling the need for housing. Right. In it, so in that sense, it it is just a, a more standard. Um, Use in the in the term of like in the terms of a cup, but there are other ones too. Yeah. I mean, they can serve other functions. It can be useful in the sense that yeah. it's meaningful. Yeah, that can yeah. be a use function, I think. Because but I you mean that like that's you're differentiating like being something useful in terms of like it being valuable to me versus it being like a cup is still valuable to me because otherwise I have to drink water mm -hmm. out of my hands. Yeah. yeah. Which is just another kind of cup, right? <laughs> like, yeah, and I'm trying to be a smart. No, no, it's interesting. <laughs> I, I love. Because this I'm just about. like because I'm interested in how we talk about use, um, and when we talk about usefulness, like what do we mean? Because I feel like it's a concept that could have either a very narrow, mm -hmm. like application, mm -hmm. or a very broad one. Mm -hmm. So I'm just curious about how how do we assign value? How do we assign use to what we do? Yeah. Um, or there's very something very literal. People can use yeah. this to I mean, pee. <laughs> like, I think that, that probably the way it, it normally has happened within the art world, though, is that it's art has been defined as not having anything other than symbolic use. Mm -hmm. And then that that's one of the reasons why on this totally other thing, there's like a craft art uh, argument or something that crafts not art because it's because well, it might serve as a cup or something like that. And that, that there's like a long history and current you know, challenges around it. But then there's another one which isn't about craft, but is about um, serving other kinds of functions, which I think oftentimes the social engaged kinds of work, potentially documentary, um, other other kinds of things like that, where they they're functioning. They're not providing a direct function like a cup. But they're also not only acting in symbolic terms. They may be like yeah. organizing something, facilitating something, educating some, you know, whatever like that, that um, is in some other area. You can say like, well, that abstract painting has educated me. But that, I think, is different from something that is, that's intention is to educate you, as opposed to the intention is to make work that fits within um, Ultimately, a sort of commercial structure um, of providing yeah. commodity that can be bought by yeah. rich people and institutions. No, I, I, 
I mean, I'm, I'm there with you. I'm, I'm just curious about how we can see what you're yeah. thinking about these things, rather than just maybe assuming something. And I'm interested about Julie Perini's thoughts about on that. Like, what do you think? <laughs> oh, I don't know. These questions that come up in art discourses, I find something about them is sad to me. That these are the questions that. Um, I mean, I'm saying this as someone who comes a lot more out of like a film conversation, um, where those aren't the questions. I don't know if it's because it's always been an industry slash field slash art form based on theaters and audiences and ticket sale, you know, um, that isn't as connected to creating an art object you can give a value to. It's more about creating experiences, like creating a film viewing experience. But for whatever reason, that's not all exactly the fight that has been raging in those but there fields. Is a, but there is know. a film industry right. even bigger, crazier than the art world mm -hmm. as far as like budget. It's very and, commercial. Yeah, profit. Yeah. And, oh, that's, and, I, I and that's, really, that's really different from documentary and independent film. Yeah. So it's like if somebody was basically saying like, hey, how do you justify your work in relationship to Hollywood um, film right, right. and industry oh, and, people and sales? Then it wouldn't be actually that different. Mm -hmm. Well, let's see. Oh, what do you think is sad? And maybe what? Okay. Hmm. Maybe this has to be tabled to another discussion. <clears throat> I don't mean to say like, "Hey, I'm better" or something. I just mean to say that. As, I, as someone coming a little bit from an outside, you know, like, and, and coming up against all these questions, like, over and over, what is art, you know, and over and over, how do we value art, and, you know, um, it's, and, and for some reason, I'm just reporting, like, it makes me have this wash of sadness, you know, mm -hmm. which I think could be linked to, like, because like, it seems like such a struggle, you know, like, here we have all this creativity and ideas and potential and people who, like, have something to say, you know, like artists, art people, and and then to have things get kind of sidetracked, it seems to me, by those certain questions, you know, like it just um, isn't it similar to like challenging capitalism or something like that? You that you're just in it, and unless you identify it and sort of deconstruct it, you'll just continue to sort of participate. Yeah, <laughs> and if you no, if fine. you can, if you understand yeah. it, break it down, then you can sort of make conscious choices to break from it. Mm -hmm. But if you just go along with it, you're not. Maybe it's sad when it's only self-reflexive. Like I love right. the self-reflexive quality of art. Like, mm -hmm. but when I make artworks that are only about the art world, they seem somehow, yeah, you know, uh, uh, what's the sad? <laughs> no, uh, the, like Greek myth of the person not falling in love with their own reflection. Oh uh, yeah, narcissist. Uh, narcissist. Oh, narcissistic. narcissistic. Yeah. Uh -huh. There's always, I mean, I think there's always a little bit narcissistic about doing art. Because in the end, it's about yourself. What you see, what you pay attention to, what do you find interesting, what do you find. Yeah, and, so that that yeah. and getting credit for it. And then getting credit, getting repetition. Yeah. So there's something always like narcissistic about being an artist. But when it's, only, when it's artist. only narcissistic, like, you, like yeah. some art is only narcissistic, you know, because they get consumed by that. Uh -huh. Yeah. But, or you could say that art, like paintings that are about paint, are like, you could argue are the most authentic because they're not trying to take a position on something outside of themselves. The paintings, that is. They still fit within uh, a history, tradition, and right. commercial purpose. Because, I mean, that was like abstract expressionists sort of said, oh, like, look, we're not political. But ultimately, they were by not choosing to do something right. else. And by it, by making works that could could be used in lots of different ways, including by you know CIA, the CIA, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and and rich people yeah. to have you know like so it's like if you're making a commodity object, even if it seems sort of neutral, it's not. You know, I think it's all. It's I, all like, I think that kind of gets back to like your um, white lady diaries. Is like it doesn't matter how personal whatever it is you're making is or how mundane. Like you you always have a political position like in everything that you do. Um, That's what I think. And I, I think the connection between personal and political can't, is always there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, 
there's no such thing as political art because it's all political. It's just whether or not you choose to talk about something other than the status quo. Hmm. I guess there's like overtly political art and then just sort of casually political art or the, if, if everything has sort of a politics to it then, then yeah everything has a politics to it but there's some things that also have like specific intention mm -hmm. and then other things that just that don't and that, that's similar to like like the argument of like well all art is social why do you need social practice like making a painting and showing a gallery is social but there's still a big difference between that and intentionally doing something that is participatory engages people or works outside of the status quo. I think whether or not an art piece is political goes back to our sad question of whether or not the art piece is art or not. And then I think that that is going to be a different answer, whether it's determined by the intention of the viewer or the intention of the maker yeah. as well. Exactly. So. Mm -hmm. And the institutions that surround it. And the context, of yeah. course, which is then going to determine its use, like its purpose and use. And the context is also going to determine its value. Because when you said that about, somebody said something about a painting of their family above their bed. Is that you? Or not oh, a painting, yeah. a picture, uh, yeah, a photo. Sure, sure. Right. It has a different purpose and it therefore has a different value once it then is sitting on the wall of the gallery. And I think mm -hmm. people would want to pay attention to it just because of the context it's placed in. And right. even if they didn't give a crap about it, it being in your house, right. you know. Mm -hmm. So, and I think the the, the 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 changing of location is like a political act in itself, as well, because in your change by changing its use and its purpose, uh -huh. as well. Um. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs>